As many of you know, less than 1% of black entrepreneurs receive venture capital. Um, so I'm really excited to kick off this panel today um, with four phenomenal investors, very diverse, um, both invest in, uh, in founders in the US and early stage um, founders in Africa. So I'll welcome them. We have Kovi Apadu, um, partner at A16Z and head of talent ex opportunity fund. Uh, we have Danielle Achempong, uh, founder and general partner at Visible Hands. Uh, let's call for them, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we have Eunice Ajim, founding partner at Ajim Capital. Now we have Javier Grevely, investor at Wellington Management, and founding and co-president co at Black VC here in Boston. So I'll let them all give a brief introduction of themselves. Kofi, we'll kick it off with you. All right. Um, thank, thank, you, thank you for having me here today. Um, I am the, as, as, as um, Tiffany mentioned, I'm the, um, a partner at Andreessen Horowitz, where I lead up the Talent Times Opportunity Initiative. Um, what we're focused on is investing and supporting founders who don't have the stereotypical Silicon Valley backgrounds um, prior to joining A16. So I've been with A16 for almost two years now. Prior to joining A16, I actually um, started my own fund, which I still manage on the side. And that was also focused on um, investing in diverse founders. And then before that, I was a founder two times over. So I definitely know how hard the journey is. And then prior to that, I was a management consultant and an engineer. So I've kind of run the gamut. So excited to be here today to share a little bit about what I've learned um, along my journey. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, Kofi. Uh, I'm Daniel Achampong. I am general partner and co-founder at Visible Hands. So a little bit about myself. I was born in Ghana. I came here when I was about a kid. I see my Ghanaian brother shaking his hand right there. <laughs> Um, came here when I, was, when, I was, when I was a kid. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, um, and, and I, I went to Brandeis for undergrad, and I bring those things up because it's always, you know, all those experiences have an impact and it, it, it shapes some of your perspectives. Um, went to Brandeis for undergrad, so uh, Massachusetts was kind of became some of my, my learning ground, and Leo and I went to school together, so we go way back from undergrad. Um, I, I studied economics and politics there, later worked at Goldman for some years, and then from Goldman I worked at a private equity firm called Summit Partners. Uh, around that time, you know, I really began to think about just seeing the significant pools of capital that we were investing in, in those industries, um, began to realize that a lot of those, that capital was going to men, and mostly white men. So I said, well, I know so many incredible people diverse people who are smart, are building, but they don't have access to the capital pools that I'm seeing and I'm actually helping raise and deploy. So I wanted to do something about it. And my partners and I came together to build out Visible Hands uh, as an institutional platform to identify and invest in incredible um, talent, diverse founders who are building venture scalable technology companies. Awesome. Uh, appreciate everyone coming out today. My name is Javier Grevely, uh, currently an early stage venture investor at Wellington Management. Um, for those who don't know, Wellington Management, we're a pretty large private asset manager, focused more on public equities and debt, but have an expanding uh, private investment presence. And so similar to the other panelists today, um, you know, my team is r really founded on this idea that the next generation of industry and market defining founders will be led by diverse and women founders. And so we're intentionally deploying capital um, to these founder sets, right? And fairly broad investors, but we typically index towards fintechs, B, uh, fintech B2B and consumer platforms. Um, prior to being a venture investor, I was on the growth equity side. Um, and prior to that, I was doing impact investing. Awesome. Hi, I'm African founders. <laughs> Hey, my name is Yunis Ajim, and I'm the founding partner at Ajim Capital. Um, I'm originally from Cameroon, I'm born and raised, and I moved to the United States about 11 years ago. Um, I came here as an international student. Right after graduating college, I got my first job at, my first job at Apple. And I was like, ooh, corporate America, like this is so great. Um, about a year and a half into it, I realized that the nine to five job was not for me. And I decided to quit that job to start to start a tech startup. Um, this was like in early 2017 when AI was a big deal, but nobody knew what 
it actually meant. Um, so I decided to build a marketplace connecting data science professionals to SMEs. And I thought, well, so very similar to the Airbnbs and the Ubers, I'm going to become a billionaire. Unfortunately, it never happens that way. I became homeless, my car got repossessed, I struggled to raise money. Um, but eventually, I met an investor that was just like, you know what, I believe in you. I, I can see the drive in what you're doing. And we decided to co-found and start a new company. This time, not for AI, because we were too early, but for open source software. That second company, within the first six months, we raised 750,000 in pre-seed. The second year, we raised about 3.2 million and grew the company to about 10 million in ARR. And things started getting better. Um, and then in 2020, when the pandemic happened and everybody got fired and nobody wanted to go back to work, we had a really hard time hiring in the US. And I said, let's hire in Africa. My co-founders was like, are there software engineers in Africa? <laughs> and I said, well, give me a shot and we'll figure it out. I eventually found about eight engineers in three African markets, Kenya, Rwanda, and Nigeria. But then we just had so many issues. I mean, payroll, cross-border payments. I had to drive to the bank to wire the money. And I said, there must be a better way. Um, I started looking for solutions to fixing those problems, and that opened doors to the African tech ecosystem. And the more I saw companies, the more I got excited. And by the end of 2021, I had invested in about 10 companies. My husband sitting in the back said, Eunice, we don't have that much money. You can't keep investing in these companies. Um, so I said, oh my gosh, I just raised VC money. I have to figure out how these people get money to be able to invest in companies. And everybody told me, well, you're black, you're young, you're a minority, you have a strong African accent. Nobody's going to give you money to invest in Africa. Like, what is happening in Africa? And I said, well, I will show you. In January of 2020, I made a public announcement, and I said, hi, my name is Eunice, and I'm launching a $10 million fund to invest in African tech companies. I think people resonated with my story, and within six months, we raised enough money to get to a first close. And now we have about 10 companies in our portfolio and we're still, you know, going, going through the process. <laughs> so we invest in pre-seed and seed tech companies across Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you. Wow, what a powerful story. I think I actually saw Eunice, um, I've been following Eunice on LinkedIn for a while and I've just been like soaking up everything she posts. I've posted a lot of her posts in our Slack channel. So Eunice, thank you so much for your wealth of knowledge in, in this market. I wanna dive a little deeper into each of your fund and its investment focus. Um, um, Javier, we'll kick it off with you. Um, tell us a little bit about your firm, what you do, so that the students are a little bit more knowledgeable. Yeah, absolutely. So as I me uh, mentioned, historically, uh, you know, Wellington has been focused more on equities and debt, but we, we've intentionally kind of built out our, you know, private equity or private investment uh, platform. And so we have about 10 billion in AUM spread across four different strategies. And so we have a pure play growth equity strategy, a biotech strategy, a climate tech strategy, and then I'm representing our early stage VC practice, which again is focused on intentionally deploying capital to um, women and diverse founders. And so we look at that um, really as, again, market and industry defining founders who are uh, building companies across pretty much all sectors and industries. We'll usually come in at seed um, through series A and we'll do a little bit of series B investing opportunistically. Um, we can go a little bit deeper into kind of what we look for uh, from the founder set and uh, others in a little bit. Kofi. Yeah, so um, for Talent Times Opportunity Fund, what we do is we actually started a fund in 2020, and the entire thesis of the fund is talent is evenly distributed, but opportunity isn't. And if you look at historically, if you look at what we call cultural, cultural innovation or cultural breakthroughs, it hasn't really been as supported as technological breakthroughs. So um, one of the examples we like to internally use at the firm is if you think about hip hop, as a cultural in innovation. It's something that's touched so many things, like the it's touched TikTok, it's touched so many things, but the folks who started hip hop music don't have generational wealth. 
right? That's because there was no system in place to allow them to capture the upside of what they were creating. Um, like with technological breakthroughs, like Silicon Valley exists for that. So we decided, let's look for founders. Uh, one of the things we also realized is the founders who are gonna start cultural breakthroughs are probably not gonna have the stereotypical Silicon Valley backgrounds, right? Like they're gonna come from places where it's deeply rooted in culture. So we decided from a thesis standpoint, let's look for founders who we consider those founders out of network. So they're outside of the Silicon Valley bubble and then they're building what we call cultural breakthroughs. So building companies that are informed by some kind of cultural insight. Typically those companies are consumer facing companies. And when we find these companies, we invest $100,000 into their company. Uh, uh, we find these founders, we invest $100,000 into their companies. Um, and then we put them through a 16 week um, hybrid program. It's um, 13 weeks of it is virtual. Another three weeks is in person. And the goal here is to really give you the skills and tools you need to, re, um, to scale your company. And then we also have the ability to follow on, invest in net new rounds. So outside of the initial capital that we give you, we also have the ability, if you're raising another round, obviously based on performance, we can be a part of that. We can be a part of that round. And I think it's been going really well. We've, um, we're starting another cohort in um, August. And with that cohort, we have invested in 45 companies since um, 2020. We have a few of our companies that are currently raising Series A right now. So I think if you look at it from the venture capital lens, I think what we're doing is working. We just need to do more of it. Awesome. Daniel? Yeah. So for our model, we are, we're a venture capital firm with um, run a couple of accelerators that, that's connected to it. And fundamentally is that, <clears throat> excuse me, that we're looking for incredible talent, diverse talent that just they're able to execute um, and build really phenomenal tech companies. And how you know I think about our thesis is that we're industry agnostic. So there are several, but there are several categories that I spend a lot of time in: B two B SaaS, fintech, health tech, um, and creative tools, which more is about infrastructure to support creators. Um, but for, for, for how I think about it is that with my mental model is really looking for talent, right? And then how, what's that framework? What does that look like? And at the core of it is that I'm looking for someone who really, really, really spends a lot of time to deeply understand the problem. I think that the, the solution should be iterative, right? So when I, I see people get so stuck on the idea, the idea actually is worth zero worth zero, but it's the execution of the idea that's where value is created, right? So you and I can have the same idea, but if you're pushing forward on it better than I am, you're creating the value more than I am, right? So I'm looking for founders who are obsessive about the problem. Then the other part of the mental model for me is that have they gone through the steps to put together the right team, the right resources? And then the other part is that have they actually also really thought about ensuring that this is a differentiated thing that they're bringing to market? That is not the same thing that somebody else is doing. And if somebody else is doing it, what is that unique framework about it? So, you know, those are some of the things that I'm looking for within my mental model of finding founders. And again, the idea tends to, for me is that is worth zero. So we, we are industry agnostic. I just want people who can execute. I think the way we look at tech companies at Ajim Capital is a little bit, I'll say, um, different from everybody else who's focused on America. Um, and the reason why I'm saying it is because we have seen a technological advancement in the US over the last, I'll say, 10 to 30 years. Um, from the dot-com boom to, you know, the rise of the papers and then, you know, a lot of things being built on that financial infrastructure. And if you look very closely, we have seen a very similar technical advancement in other markets, Europe, China, India, LATAM. As people get access to mobile phones, laptops, the internet, um, they start to figure out ways to make their life easier, better, cheaper, faster. And I think something very similar is happening in Africa right now. Just 10 years ago, 11 years ago, when I was leaving Cameroon, I didn't have a smartphone. I didn't have access to internet connection all the time. But today, all my parents on Facebook, Instagram, Facebook, you know what I mean? Like, 
My dad is running ads for his school, so they know that they see the value of using the internet. My brother went back home and started a tech startup to be able to make it easy for. He came to the US, saw how it was easy for you to go to school, get all your grades online, do everything online. And he was like, why is it that in Cameroon, everything still has to be done on paper, pen and paper? So I'm seeing a lot of those products happening in Africa. Unfortunately, we are not reinventing the wheel. We're just making it easier and more accessible for our culture, our languages, our currencies. So we look at two ways when, th when I think of Ajim Capital Thesis. We look at things that have first been proven in other markets. So I know you're not reinventing the wheel, but also making sure that it is the time in Africa, in your country, to be able to build that product. And then on the other one, we're looking for African problems solving African with African solutions. For example, I invested in a company called Split. I don't think that is a problem in the US, but Split, for example, when you go to a lot of African markets, you have to pay rent 12 to 16 months ahead of time before even getting in the apartment just because of the lack of credit and so many other things. And Split makes it easy to rent now and pay later. Again, not necessarily something you see in the US, but definitely an African problem with an African solution. So that's the way we look at our thesis. And when it comes specifically to the founder, I mean, it's God intuition, man. <laughs> you just know if somebody's a hustler, right, that they will not give up no matter what. Because really, when you think, you think about entrepreneurship, that's really what it takes. It's like, will you stick around? Are you so passionate about this problem that you'll be working on it for the next 10 to 15 years if you got zero money or zero funding? And when I can see that in the founder, and I can tell that they're really passionate and they really understand the problem, a lot of the times, like, I'll commit to them. Awesome. Well, one of the things I shared with the students yesterday, we were talking about relationships, is that values have to align and it has to be mutually beneficial. Um, and that goes for um, investor-founder relationships. So we all know underrepresented founders face several challenges. What challenges have you seen um, the founders in your portfolio face? And how do you as an investor mitigate that? I'll take this. Um, I think just the funding problem, right, where um, I think you, you, you mentioned the stat, like, you hear that stat so many times and it's actually not getting better. It, in some cases, it's getting worse, right? So I think that's one of the biggest challenges. And I think another challenge that um, I've seen our founders face is they oftentimes have a scarcity mentality since it's so hard to raise money once they actually do raise money, they don't deploy that capital, right? Like they're, they're using it very, very carefully. And it's hard to run fast that way. I think um, having the mindset of, okay, once I raise capital, I need to deploy this capital against a certain strategy. And if it works, it works. It doesn't work, it doesn't work. And I think one of the things, um, some of the, um, the founders that I've mentored, invested in, one of the things that I keep trying to get across to them is no investor invests in a company with the thought that the graph is gonna be up and to the right, right? So I, um, what happens is I think a lot of times diverse founders get, uh, almost get scared or nervous to share bad news with their investors. And if you don't share news with your investors or your advisors, what happens is it's hard for me to help you until it's too late, right? So I'll have founders who come to me and they have like two months of runway left. Where if they came to me when they had like six months of runway left, there's a way for us to course correct, right? It's, it's, it's almost that scarcity mentality of, or that mentality of, it, it, I worked so hard to get this money, I don't wanna disappoint people, right? But you, we, we all know, as I think every investor is mature enough to understand that we are invested in a high failure rate environment, so eight out of 10 of our companies are gonna fail. Right. What we want to know, what we want to know from those eight companies are, have we done everything possible to stay alive and to be able to do everything possible to stay alive? I think communication is key. Right. So I always advise my founders, like monthly updates are a must for me. So for us to follow on with any of our investments, you actually have to be sending monthly updates. That's because investors want to know where, what's happening with their money. Right, and how can I help you grow the money that I gave you? Right, so I think well, that challenge of not being communicative, 
I'm having a scarcity mindset are two big things that I see a lot of diverse founders, or two traps that I see a lot of diverse founders kind of fall, fall into because they feel like if they fail, the next diverse founder behind them is going to be unable to raise capital, which is not the case. Like the whole ecosystem should not be on your shoulders. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with that, Kofi. And something to add is, first of all, big shout out to this program, what you all are experiencing here, because the network piece is super critical. Um, being tapped into networks that you can go to someone and say, hey, I'm having this challenge, you know, who can I speak to? That is so invaluable. That if you don't have those type of networks, then you kind of get stuck. The other thing that I'll add is that, you know, I've seen also, and I think imposter syndrome is real. It's, it's real. We all go through it. We face it. Uh, and what I share with our founders is that whenever you walk in that room, know that you belong. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're asking for that check, know that you can get it. You may hear a no, but you still are qualified. You're the one building the business. You feel confident in asking for that and asking for that check. So we go through this process of, of ensuring that our founders feel supported, that they feel seen. And you know, the, the, one of the, the imposter syndrome, I think, is something that is a really difficult thing to, to get through. But just really, really know that you really belong in this room. You spent so much time on this business, more than I have. All right, so I should expect you to be an expert and speak like the expert, have the confidence like the expert. So I highly encourage that you belong in a room. So I think the two things I dive into one would just be as it you know relates to our founder set and even uh, founders we haven't invested in yet issues that uh, are commonly faced right. So one's going to be on the geographic side and the other is going to be the network side. And so on the geographic side, there's a status quo that's typically associated with different markets in terms of like who's building what. So here in Boston, we're known as the life science capital of the world, biotech, healthcare, that's just what we're known for, right? LA might be more on the consumer side, Atlanta's gonna be in entertainment media. What happens you know, if you're not building within those areas, right? So essentially, capital allocators and investors are gonna go where there's innovation and entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs and founders are gonna go where there's capital allocators and investors. So you end up becoming landlocked because you don't fall within the status quo or where, wherever you're building might not necessarily be what's prevalent within that area. So we've mitigated that by making sure we're intentionally spending time in areas that just aren't as known to the market. I think you guys have probably heard of Steve Case and Rise of the Rest and a lot of more funds are spending time in areas that are typically just not looked at. We're definitely spending a lot more time in the Orlandos, Atlantas of the world, et cetera, but also just trying to make sure that founders are introduced to the bigger markets, right? Just because you're not building in Boston, New York, San Francisco, that's where the capital is at. So regardless of how you get there, how you're spending time there, you need to be connected into the ecosystem because you have to have the visibility. And so we try to make sure that we're powering the people in our portfolio, but even those we don't invest in to have uh, exposure. The second is going to be the network. I think Daniel and Kofi kind of mentioned this, but look, a lot of us didn't come through the Phillips Academy, Goldman Sachs, uh, Stanford, Harvard system, but that doesn't mean we can't be in the room. I think when we talk about the 1% funding, we typically you know, make it seem like it's a mistake. The elephant in the room is that it's intentional, right? A lot of these guys went to school together. They grew up together. We talk about things like generational wealth. We've just been landlocked from these opportunities, so we don't see what's behind the curtain. And so I think for us, we're just trying to make sure that we are spending more time talking about these issues and kind of thinking about it. Y'all can clap. <laughs> <laughs> Every time they speak about the challenges, I'm always like, man, if you guys can imagine what it takes for African Americans to get funding, just multiply that by 100, and that's what it helps harder. It is for African founders. Um, and the reason, and it's very understandable, right? Like you mentioned it, Daniel mentioned it, like, why would you leave the US, right? A market that you understand a very specific city that you understand to go all the way across another continent to invest in another company. So when, for me, I think 
my African founders, like what I would advise instead of speaking about the challenges, because we know fundraising is a challenge, right? Um, and I hear all the time, even me as a VC, fundraising to invest in Africa, I always hear we don't have an Africa strategy. And that's very understandable, because when you go and you raise money from LPs, all VCs, we take money from other people, you usually tell them very specifically where you're going to be investing your money in. And it's very difficult for you to get outside of that thesis. So when people say, we don't invest in Africa, I think there's a walk around and a way you can structure your funding to be able to get US money. The first thing is that I think a lot of African founders don't realize that for you to get any, and I mean any, US money, you need to be a Delaware C Corp. Like that's just the name of the game. Like you can't register your company in Ghana and expect a US investor that has no idea where Ghana is, <laughs> right? And like what a jurisdiction in that community looks like. So a lot of my founders usually have a Delaware C Corps as a holding company. And then they use whatever African country as you know um, the subsidiary. And the good thing with also having a holding company in Delaware is because as you expand into other African market, you can still have that as your parent company and then have all the other jurisdictions under you. It makes it easy because they understand that law. They understand how, what they are putting their money in. They know exactly what percentage of the company they are getting. And also, I, depending on like what company you're building, I think it's very important to always take comparable. So for example, one of my companies is called Rennes. When I helped them to go fundraise, I kept using Deal. Deal is like a $10 billion company here. It's a payroll tech, it's boring. But guess what? They understood. So we went and we targeted every investor had invested in Deal in the US and said, I know you made a good deal investing in Deal at pre -seed. And guess what? Deal has been acquiring every single counterpart in other markets to expand into that market. They recently acquired a company in Australia for 200 million. Guess what? When they're thinking about expanding into Africa, these companies are the best that are growing that fast. Right? Like you might want to get into this deal. Speak their language. You have to be able to understand what are they looking for. At the end of the day, they're looking for returns. And, you, and it does not matter whether you have the beautiful idea or the best thing in mind. You have to show them what they know and what they understand. Um, so instead of speaking of the challenge, I'd rather speak of a strategy on how to fundraise. Can I, can I double click on something? Yeah, I, 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 it's spot on Eunice about speaking the language. So in going out to raise, um, if your, your business is venture scalable business, you know, and actually one quick thing there is that not everybody, not every company is a venture model, right? So really spending time to understand that, what that means and what that looks like. Because as an investor in, in venture, there's an expectation of return that, that we model for. So if you are going to raise for venture capital, Understand that language. Spend time to, to see, you know, why do we take a certain percentage and how does that lead into the, you know, the value of your business or the expectation of value of your business. So spending the time to learn the language could become really helpful. So then when you do show up, immediately we're like, this person is prepared. Again, it's always trying to understand, can this founder execute, right? And that's part of spending time to prepare and know the language as well. I want to talk about the founders who are disrupting this space. So our team, we host uh, a workshop called Pitch and Better um, that's based on research done from Professor Laura, Laura Wong, who previously went to um, Harvard Business School. And she traveled and uh, studied 180 founders who pitched investors. And what she found was that underrepresented founders got asked more preventative questions, while white men got asked more promotional questions. And she developed a framework that taught these founders how to overcome biases in the room, which led to these founders raising, I think, it's about $7.5 million more than they initially would. So I would love for each of you to just talk about the founders who are disrupting this space 
entering those rooms, overcoming these biases, and giving these investors absolute FOMO for not investing in them. And who look like us? So, Kofi, we'll kick it off with you. Yep. Um, so there's a company called um, Squire Technologies. It's a barbershop app. I actually know both of the founders. Um, we're friends back um, back in New York. And what is HBS2? No, um, Yale. Yeah, Yale, 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 Yale Law. Yale yeah. Yale. Um, but it's, for them, like going into pitching investors, which I think is a really good mindset to have, they didn't take anything personally. Mm -hmm. Right? Like you need to... You need to just forget the last no, right? Because if you're still uh, like harping on the, the last no, it's just going to be difficult to move forward. I think there's rules of engagement in raising money, which is you're going to hear more no's than yeses. Like coming into the game, you know it's hard. So they had that mindset of we're going to hear a bunch of no's. And one of the things that um, one of the founders, I know one of the founders a bit more than the other, um, the personality trait is, it's he has this concept of I don't tell myself no, mm -hmm. right? Oftentimes it's um, folks who look like us would sort of disqualify themselves by saying they I don't I don't think they invest in black founders. I'm not even going to pitch them, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you're you're doing yourself a disservice, right? So what I really loved about their approach is. We're just going to pitch as many people as possible, right? Going into it, they knew it was going to be difficult, regardless of the fact that one of the founders had a, a law degree from Yale and worked at one of the top like startup law firms and knew about venture capital. That didn't matter. They still heard a bunch of no's, but they went in with the mindset of, we're going we're gonna to keep pitching. And then also, I think what some folks um, that look like us need to figure out is there are two ways to make money, right? When you're building a company, you either make money from investors or you make money from customers. Mm -hmm. You don't do one and then wait for the other. You have to do it simultaneously. That's why oftentimes it's hard for investors to invest in solo founders because if you're out pitching, who's building the company, right? So I think going into it with the mindset of I'm going to keep doing, I think someone said um, the passion, I'm going to keep building this thing. Even if you said, you say no, Y Combinator actually on their application has a question. I think the question was, I don't know if they still have it, but it was, uh, what, what are you going to do if you don't get into Y Combinator? And I think that's their way of trying to figure out, do you need us to keep building your company? If that's the case, we don't want to be a part of your company. Right, like I want, I want to invest in someone who's going to be building a company, irregardless of me being a part of the company. And I think that's what helps when you're pitching, when you're pitching um, investors, is going in there with confidence. I think Daniel mentioned confidence. Confidence is number one. Really being, and um, um, being married to the problem and not your solution. Right. I think oftentimes founders have like this one solution, and they're. They're gun hole about the solution, um, and they're just focused on that solution, and they actually sometimes lose sight of the problem. And then the third thing is you also have to understand that just because you heard a no doesn't mean you don't keep that investor updated, right? Like if you heard, if, if you're if you're building a, a company in ad tech and you pitch a health tech investor, like that's going to be a no. Don't worry about it. But if it's a if it's an investor that's in your space. Just keep them updated. And I'm, I'm such a big believer in um, monthly updates because what happens is you're sending them to a group of investors. I'm reading it. I'm seeing the progress that you're making. And then my job as an investor is to find companies to invest in. So if I met with you and I thought, okay, there's something there, but it might be too early, and you're updating me each month, and I'm seeing that there's growth there. I'm seeing you as a founder. You're hiring people. Um, it gets me excited, right? And then the fourth thing is to, to have a winning pitch. You have to show that you're someone who can convince people from storytelling. Because in the early days, you're resource constrained. Meaning to hire people, you're probably going to pay them less than they're actually worth. Right, but you have to be able to convince them and tell a story. So I think oftentimes if you can't convince an investor to invest in your company, they also think you can't hire people, which 
building any company, the most important resource you're going to need is you're going to need people. I, I'm glad you mentioned Squire because yesterday the young men needed barbers. <laughs> and I said to them, I said, okay, download Squire. How many of you downloaded Squire? Like all 20 of us. Yeah. <laughs> and then I put them in an Uber and said, okay, go to the barbershop. <laughs> so I'm really glad you mentioned that and they got to use a platform that a phenomenal founder is built in. Danielle. That's awesome. Um, so a company that entrepreneurs that I, I'm really excited about as it relates to this context. So we've, we've invested in over 100 companies. Um, and this one is a company founded by four black women, two MIT computer science PhD students, and two Wharton MBAs. And what they're building is, is a company is called Parfait, and the idea is to use computer vision to um, allow people to purchase customized wigs. And when I first met the founder, she just had, this was actually her first deck. And, you know, she told me about the challenges of trying to raise $30,000. That's what she wanted in the beginning. And when I, you know, had the conversation to understand the problem she was trying to solve, the team that she's put together, I was like, wait, 30 grand? And you guys are not getting 30 grand? And again, four black women two MIT computer science PhD students in computer vision, and two Wharton MBAs who have you know, backgrounds coming from Amazons of the world, right? So it was like, that didn't make sense to me. So we became one of the first institutional investors in the business and supported them in their fundraising journey, helping them refine their storytelling and the pitches. They went on to raise $5 million with Serena Williams and uh, Upfront being you know, the, the lead investor. But for me, what I learned in that process was that, you know, there is, that there's also a, a bias that was happening. Um, that the challenges that, you know, diverse founders face, but also women face, right? And those are some of the things we got to call out. Um, and I also learned about, began to understand, really helping people understand, um, understand what are you tr really trying to solve and how can you um, help them explain and get the context of the cash flow that they're, they have to model for? So I talked about the, you know, ensuring that your investors, you speak the investor language. So helping them go through this process of, all right, if you're going to raise a certain amount of money, understand the background of how they, they want to model for, how they're going to give you the money and also ex expect what they're going to get from it. So we went through this training of really sharpening and refining their story. And then lastly, helping them understand that they belong in that room and asking for more than the 30, 30 grand uh, and being confident in that ask. So I love working with them. They're crushing it. And I'm really excited about the technology. So it's called Parfait. Highly recommend you all to check it out, especially if you're looking for customized wigs. Um, it's a phenomenal business. Yeah, that's a great case study. And uh, a few of my teammates have used Parfait, so shout out to, shout out to the uh, squad over there. Um, so a uh, recent investment that I'm super excited about is a company called Binky. And so what Binky essentially does is authenticate and verify FSA and HSA payments. I don't know if any of you have experience using FSAs or HSAs, but it's a very complex, pretty intricate um, experience that's not really the most accessible for millennials and Gen Zs. Mill uh, billions and billions of these funds go unused um, every year, and it's a huge issue. And so what these guys have essentially created is the ability to process these payments. Um, and so the idea is that you'd be able to go to GoPuff or Instacart, Target, whatever it may be, um, and use your FSA, HSA for items that you typically didn't know were eligible for that. Our thesis behind that is, if anyone here has ever used food stamps or SNAP or EBT, 15, 20 years ago, you can only really use these at like Dollar General or Dollar Store. Now you can go into Whole Foods, Amazon, all types of stores and use your EBT. We think it's going to be the same thing with FSA, HSA, where you can go to Target, Walmart, online, in person, and be able to kind of use these, uh, this uh, tax advantage uh, funding. And so Obi, who's the um, CEO and founder, she, uh, African woman, moved to the States um, a few decades ago. She essentially helped build um, McKinsey's healthcare practice, saw this was a huge issue, and essentially spun out the um, company from uh, the essential inception. And so there, there's a few characteristics that she has, I think, just in general are very attractive in founder set. So one is just going to be situational awareness, right? The ability to kind of know, like, use of proceeds, product roadmap, 
traction today, where you're going to go, et cetera. Very ha hands-on with that and just super in the know with everything within her business. I think we see lack of situation awareness a lot. I think Kofi just mentioned an example. If you're coming to an investor and you only have two months of runway, that's a huge issue. And so you, can, you can't plan five to 10 years ahead, but to really know your product roadmap to the T, especially at the early stages, is, is a huge signal, I think, for us as investors we look for. The second that I think is really important is just efficiency, right? Time is money. You know, you only have so much runway and the ability to hit on your targets and milestones. And again, going back to the quarterly reports, communicate effectively like what your needs are and where you're trying to go to investors. We're really looking for those things. The third, which I think trumps uh, the other two, are just the hustle mentality. And I think we talk a lot about hustle mentality as just going to the conferences and conventions and chasing down co uh, customers or whatever it may be. But there's also just this idea that, you know, you only have so much money in the bank account. You only are making so much revenues. You're essentially bootstrapping the company. I look at hustle mentality as, okay, you're a founder and president, but you're also a electrician, you're administrative assistant, you're uh, DevOps, you're engineer, et cetera, right? Because on the, you think about a pre-seed seed company, your capital is so tight. And so you're going to have to wear a lot of hats at once. So looking at these founders who are willing to, you know, stay after the events and clean up, who are willing to kind of work with their CTOs a little bit closer than they need to, who are the ones kind of, you know, founder-led sales, the ones who are focused on getting the customers in the early days, that, that's just a huge sign for us of someone who's a hustler and kind of willing to get deep into nitty-gritty. Awesome. Um, I think every time they ask me, like, who is your favorite company, right? I'm, I'm sorry, I can't pick one of my babies. Um, but since I spoke about Rennes earlier, I'm going to give you a story. Uh, they were actually one of my first investments outside of my fund. When I met the founder of Rennes, um, very technical founder, right? He was not a marketing, but like a sales, like he did not have any energy. Um, but he knew his product to the T. He's, he built a product from scratch. Um, and it was so good. Like he had worked at another company called Andela, which is one of Africa's unicorn. Um, they were big at hiring software engineers. But one of the challenges that they faced were when those American companies were hiring engineers, payroll was a big issue. So he stepped out and started to build um, the payroll tech side of hiring just employees in Africa. And he spoke to every HR person he could find, really understand the product, the design, and he built everything. So the day that I had a meeting with him, he was very quiet. Hey, this, this is why I built this, and this is what I'm doing. And then he said, let me give you a demo. And then he gets his laptop, and then he shows me from point A to B, from the contracting in every single African country, the fact that he had different currencies. Like, everything was so good, but he was barely making 3000 in monthly recurring revenue. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to invest because I know how to market your business. Um, Within six months, he went from 5,000 in MRA, from 3,000 in MRA to 112,000 in monthly recurring revenue. And he got into Texas. Like I said, we chased down every deal, investor, and employee we could get. Not only did we do that, but one of the growth of partnership at Deal reached out to us and said, we're interested in acquiring um, Rennes for what they are doing. We said no because we were too early, but we are very interested in keeping the communication. Just last month, he sent me his update, and now they are doing 212000 in monthly recurring revenue. So they've pretty much, I don't even know how many X that is, but I invested in them last June. So you can see, like for me, I was like, that is a good example of like, I might not be a, you know, a salesperson or the fundraiser or the customer chaser, but I'm really good at building a product that customers love. Um, and that was his experience. I think the other thing too that I want to mention, especially to founders, when I, sh when I showed up on this seat and they said, hey, Eunice, what's, you know, like, who are you? I gave you guys my story. I didn't say, hi, I invest in African tech companies. I told you guys my story from point A to point B to point C and to where I am today. And I think sharing a story is so important. And I think every single founder, when they join a meeting with me, I share my story first. So they understand that I'm human too. And I expect to hear the story and why they are building what they are building. I think it's so small, but like it makes a big difference when you're building a company. Like really take a step back and ask yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? 
like why am I so passionate about this program? And you can, if you can really craft that into a story that is relatable and people can buy into it, that's how you buy investors. That's how you buy into customers. That's how you buy into employees. And I think story, story, storytelling is something that people take for granted, but it's such a big deal. Um, so that's it for me. Well, we're, we're about time. Um, if you all can just leave just some quick tips um, or inspiration to our student founders. I know that we have the next multi-million dollar company in this room, yeah. speaking that into existence. Right. So any advice you have, and then we'll probably ask one to two, two to three questions, and I'll hand it over to my manager, Charlotte and Matt, um, to just give you all a quick welcome. So. Um, so I think it's important, especially at this stage, to remember that people invest, uh, uh, investors invest in people. Like when I'm investing in a founder, uh, when I'm investing in a company, I'm actually investing in a founder because in my mind, this is probably going to fail. But if it fails, am I going to invest in your next thing? Mm -hmm. And that's when you're in the game, that's what you want. So keep a positive attitude as you're going through this journey. Like it's not easy. If it was, everybody else would be doing it and just keep, just keep the lines of communication open. Like share bad news, if you have bad news, don't sit on it. Things often don't get better, right? They get worse if you sit on it, so just share bad news if you have bad news and just keep a positive attitude. Yeah, I would add that. I would add that being a founder is really hard. It's one of the most difficult things that you're gonna take on. But it doesn't mean you have to do it alone. All right. It could be a lonely journey, but you don't have to do it alone. So this network that you've built here, really use it. You know, tap into it. Reach out to the people and say, hey, I need help. And the other thing is also just take care of yourself. You're a founder, but you're also many other things. And I emphasize this for me, uh, this is kind of adv advice for myself. You know, I'm a founder, but I'm a brother. I'm a you know, I, I, I'm a friend. There's so many things that you are beyond a founder. So the things that are important for your mental health, really, really spend time on that. Take care of yourself so you don't have to do this journey alone. Yeah, so I'll end where um, Daniel started off with just this idea that you guys belong here, right? You know, you guys are representing some of the best HBCUs and African universities in the world. And I'm sure friends, family, and peers have told you why are you guys going to Boston? What, what are you doing in the all-white city? Or you know, why are you guys going to the states? Like, what you know, what are you going to be doing there? At the end of the day, you guys made it, right? You're here. You're here with Harvard Innovation Labs. You're working with AWS. You've beat a lot more statistics than you realize. And so, what I would, you know, what I'd say is capture the energy, uh, capture the moment, seize the moment, and realize like you've come really far, right? I, I know we, uh, Tiffany mentioned that the next million dollar startup is here, but maybe the next billion dollar startup's here, right? You know, reach for the goals that you're aiming for, and just know that you deserve to be here. Okay. I'm going to give a very unconventional advice. <laughs> um, I think the panelists mentioned all great um, advice, but I think for me, I'm going to go very specifically to fundraising. I think every time, I remember when I was still a founder and I would ask for advice, I'm like, how do I fundraise? How do I meet those people? And I would get the very typical things. Go to events, you know, call email. Reach out to your friends and families, and they can, you know, they can give you money. Like my dad is in Africa. <laughs> like there's no way my dad is gonna give me a million dollars. And then the one thing I realize is that today we have, and this is not for everybody, but if you can resonate to this, I'll say that today. Today we have something very powerful, which is the internet. And. I think building in public, and again, this is not for everybody, but if you have the heart, right, start today, build in public. Um, and what I mean by that is share your story and your journey along the way. Whatever you're doing, get whatever platform you feel comfortable, whether it be LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, whatever that might be, build in public. Um, you will find customers, you will find investors. In fact, they will find you, right? Because if you keep sharing something, I mean, my Ghanaian friend that was here, he was like, 
you're one of the people that I look up to on social media. Right? I've been following you on Twitter for so long, and when I saw that you were showing up in the room, I was so excited to see you. Founders come to me, investors come to me. I told you guys that I shared my story publicly because when I said that I wanted to fundraise, people said, well, for you to raise money as a VC, you need to know institutional investors. You need to know the right connection. And I said, unfortunately, I don't. But you know what I know what to do? I know how to market the shit out of myself. <laughs> I'm sorry for cursing. Um, and I do that, right? And, bef and like people end up coming to me. Like every single week, I get inbounds from founders and I get inbounds from investors saying, your posts keep popping on my LinkedIn feed and I don't know why, but I am interested in what you're doing. And it's such a basic advice, but if you don't have the right network and you don't have the right resources, those people might just be one follower away from, you know, from your investor or your next customer or your next employee. Again, very unconventional advice. Still do all the other things that you're being told to do, but this is like one small thing that has worked out for me. Whether it's like even podcasting, whether you're a YouTuber, like right? if you love being on YouTube or video, or if you just love writing, and even if you don't know how to write, just start. You will get better over time. Thank you. Thank you all. Like I said, that's how I found Yuna. She's on my feed every day. <laughs> and I inboxed her. I was like, wow, this girl is absolute badass. I need to know who, who exactly she is. Um, but with that said, thank you all so much for being a part of their journey. Um, for the four of you, you belong here as well. We need you here, and we need more of you. So continue to lift as you climb. Continue to share your story and just inspire those of you and others in the room.